Oh, here it is. I can put it underneath. I can just, there's a glass underneath. Sure. Okay. Uh, we close the outside door there, but we're good. Kick, out, kick off the, uh, the conference with our, our plenary talk tonight. And um, just a, a few reminders that immediately after uh, the plenary talk tonight, we'll have our icebreaker just up the stairs outside the doors here. And also a reminder that our AGM is tomorrow night, also in this building. And our banquet is Wednesday night. So check the schedules for uh, locations, but uh, make sure we don't miss those. So before I introduce tonight's speaker, I'd like to um, acknowledge sponsors for the evening. The University of Waterloo Water Institute is sponsoring tonight's talk, and being president, I'm here to, to, to welcome you, and also being a, a Waterloo faculty member, a member of the Water Institute, I'm also supposed to tell you a little bit about uh, tonight's sponsor. The Water Institute was initiated about five years ago at the University of Waterloo. It's comprised of uh, more than 150 faculty members across six faculties, 19 departments, and more than 400 students currently involved in, in research in the Water Institute. And it was formed really to, to sort of demonstrate and, and, and formalize that long-standing commitment that the University of Waterloo has had towards education, research, and water-related fields. Not only water science, but also aspects of, of water management and, and water policy. So it's, uh, it's a, a nice mesh of the Water Institute's interest in tonight's uh, plenary speaker. Aaron Thompson from Environment Canada, who will, who's the uh, co-chair of the International Niagara Board of control and is going to speak to us tonight about Niagara Falls and a lot of aspects of the falls that um, we won't 
already know, and probably there'll, there'll be parts of Niagara Falls I'm sure we'll, we'll uncover during this week here that maybe we, we shouldn't uncover, but uh, there'll be some interesting aspects of the falls, the, the physical end of things that uh, Aaron's going to tell us about tonight. So enjoy the talk, welcome, and I look forward to seeing you all at the, the icebreaker after the talk as well. Aaron? Thanks, Rick. Good evening, and thanks to the uh, organizers of this conference, the Canadian Geophysical Union, for inviting and giving me the opportunity to give the, the public lecture. Um, as Rick mentioned, I'm employed with Environment and Climate Change Canada. I work down in Burlington, Canada Centre for Land Waters. But I'm also the uh, Canadian co-chair for what's called the International Niagara Border Control, and I'll explain that what that is during my presentation. Um, the Border Control reports the IJ's International Joint Commission, and we uh, go out yearly to the public to explain our activities and uh, to get input onto our activities. Um, so this is a little bit of a different forum for us um, than we've used in the past, but, uh, and given that it's a, a conference, um, and I had a little bit longer time than I usually do, we, we built on the uh, presentation that we normally give and added uh, quite a bit of history um, that I hope you'll find interesting um, in regards to hydropower uh, generation and the history around hydropower generation at uh, Niagara Falls. Millions of people come to Niagara Falls every year and uh, spend their time um, either on Clifton Hill at the amusement parks, uh, walking in front of the falls, um, viewing, taking in its, its natural beauty. But uh, there's a lot that's going on behind the scenes and has gone behind the scenes, and I hope to tell a little story here with that tonight um, that I hope you'll find interesting. Now, so the lecture tonight, uh, I'm going to go over the history of the Niagara Falls area from a geologic perspective, but also a human perspective. And then we're talking about the different governance mechanisms that have been developed by Canada and the United States uh, to look after the, uh, the sharing of the water in Niagara Falls, um, those various boards and committees that are listed on the screen. Um, and then we'll talk about uh, some of the activities that the Niagara Border Control is currently undertaking. Um, and then we'll have a, a time period for, for questions and discussion. So, to start off the, with the history of the whole area, the whole, the whole southern uh, Great Lakes Basin is really formed and changed by the, the retreat of the Laurentian Ice Sheet. That was about 20,000 years ago. Um, there was a, a sheet of ice several kilometers thick over this whole area that, that grew and covered over the Great Lakes Basin. And it started to retreat back about 20,000 years ago. As it retreated, uh, the Great Lakes Basin were formed. So we can see it about 14,000 years ago as the ice was retreating, we had a, a couple lakes there that started to appear. And the drainage of those lakes is different than it was today. It, it drained to the south. Um, the second image there, 9,000 years ago, um, you can see some of the, the Great Lakes starting to form, but again, the, the water, the outlets were either out of Lake, modern day Lake Michigan, or there was a start of the, um, the drainage out of the Lake Ontario. 7,000 years ago, um, looking more like today, but the, the drainage was different. And up to 4,000 years ago, with the complete um, retreat of that ice sheet, uh, actually the water, most of the water flew out of out of what's now Lake Huron, out towards the Ottawa River and the St. Lawrence River. Um, so this process, uh, since the retreat of the ice sheet, the, the whole the land is rising, it's continuing to rise today, and that has, has some um, ongoing impacts in, in relation to, to uh, Great Lakes and, and water levels that we'll talk about later on. The Niagara River, and specifically, um, so you have all of the drainage area from the upper lakes, Lake Superior, Michigan, Huron, Erie, 
uh, is draining through the Niagara River and flowing over Niagara Falls. Uh, the location of the original falls is different than it is today. It was several kilometers uh, downstream here. And uh, there's been, due to that large volume of water that's flowing down the Niagara River and uh, the erosional forces, the falls have retreated back to its, its current location uh, today. Here you see a cross section of the Niagara Falls, and you can see the remarkable depth below the falls. This is the, the, the level of the water level uh, below the falls, but the, the plunge pool is, is quite deep. There's strong erosional forces that are still going on that are eating away at the, the face of Niagara Falls. Um, you can see these other lines depict the, the water level downstream at the Whirlpool, which is a few kilometers downstream, and uh, down at Lake Ontario. Now, the uniqueness of having that large amount of water flowing down a river uh, with, its, with that large drop um, it, is it created uh, great interest in, in time, um, both uh, for its beauty purposes but also for its, uh, its potential for hydropower. The Niagara River is unique because the, the flows in the river are fairly consistent. On a long-term average basis, the, the flow in the river is between 5,500 and 6,000 cubic meters per second. So a very large amount. Um, but what's unique about Niagara compared to other big rivers in the world is that uh, it doesn't have uh, a large fluctuation. The, the lows are only three to 4,000 cubic meters and the highs, 65, 75 cubic meters per second. Um, so it's only about a factor of two between the, the low flow and the high flow. This is quite a bit different than other large rivers in the world like the Columbia or the Mississippi where the maximum could be 30 times as great as, as the minimum. And also with the, the, the fall of 60 meters, of about 60 meters at, at the Niagara Falls, um, it was really recognized that there's great potential for hydropower development. So the first, uh, the first use of, of water or, uh, occurred a couple hundred years ago. There was a, a water wheel that was created in, uh, above the falls in about 1759. Then there was um, industrial power production started late in the 1800s. Uh, now, the plant size at that point in time was limited because they didn't have the ability to, to trans transfer the power. Um, so that posed a bit of a, an engineering problem uh, because of you know, this great mass of water, uh, great uh, fall, but there wasn't the ability to uh, transfer that power low over long distances. So the Niagara Falls Power Company offered a $100,000 prize um, for a solution to that, to that problem. And eventually there was a, a solution uh, which was alternating current. Uh, George Westinghouse developed that. And so then they had this sort of ability to transfer that power over long distances. And shortly thereafter, the first powerhouse uh, came to be. Now the first powerhouse in the area was called the Adams Powerhouse, and this was on the United States side. It opened up in 1894, uh, just above, above Niagara Falls. Here's a slide of the, what Niagara Falls, New York looked like in around the turn of the century at, at 1900. So you had uh, intense, manufacturing intense, uh, a lot of sawmills started to show up. Um, they had diverted water from above the falls down there was a hydraulic canal that fed uh, water to these mills that would then flow through uh, down into the, into the gorge of Niagara. So you had quite a bit of development um, right, right in this area. This is a picture that shows the reverse side of those mills where you had 
just, it, it wasn't a very pretty site at that point. Um, there, but there was large pressure to, 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 to develop and make use of that water. Now the Niagara Falls Commission, um, not part of my, uh, the Niagara Parks Commission, it's not really part of my talk, but they've taken many steps over the years to try and clean up the area, to try and um, take away the, the industry and, and move it away from the falls to preserve sort of the natural beauty. You can see in the early 1900s, uh, that, that wasn't a concern, and it was just really a pretty, pretty ugly sight, and different than what we'd see today. Shortly thereafter, in about 1904, there was a, uh, a large power plant developed in, in the New York side uh, called the Sholkoff State, opened in, in 1904. There's a, this is a picture of actually two different hydropower stations. One came a little bit later. I'll talk about that. But the first power station was developed in 1904, and that was at the base of, of the gorge in, in Niagara Falls, New York. Over on the Canadian side, there was also pressure uh, and interest in developing hydropower. So this is a picture of the Ontario Power Generation Plant. It opened in 1905. Oops, button. It opened in 1905. Uh, today, it's, if, you, if you stood at the edge of uh, what's called Table Rock on the Canadian side, uh, the Brentwood Falls, if you look down to the left, the power plant rests there. Uh, it, was a, it was a privately owned uh, plant when it first opened that it later was sold to Ontario Hydro. Uh, this, this power plant produces mostly uh, 25 cycle power. Um, and, but, So in 1906, there was another power plant very close by uh, called the Toronto Power Generation Station. Another private interest was interested in, uh, in developing hydropower. power. This, this was built by the Electrical Development Company of Ontario, and the pur its purpose was to supply the power to an ever-growing Toronto. Again, this was mostly 25 cycle power. And not very far from that power plant, there was a, a third one called the Canadian Niagara or Rankin plant. It opened in 1907. Um, and the power plant is Rankin is, is named after the, uh, the founder of the company, who was the Canadian Niagara Power Company. So with this uh, rapid development and pressure to develop uh, hydropower, uh, the governments of Canada, Canada and United States uh, recognize that they had to do something to, to, uh, to, to limit the, the hydroelectric development. Um, so at the same time, there was some other uh, problems across the country. There was the uh, St. Mary and Milk diversion out west there where there was some uh, disagreements over irrigation and diversion of water at the Canada U.S. In, the, in, in lower Alberta. And there was also problems with, uh, with water quality and, and cholera problems. So the Canadian United States uh, actually came together and uh, signed what's called the Boundary Waters Treaty of 1909. And the purpose of this treaty was to uh, provide a mechanism for both the countries to uh, solve disputes that would arise over, over water sharing between Canadian and United States. Um, and the, the flow at Niagara Falls and the issues at Niagara Falls was one of the key parts of that treaty when it was originally signed. Uh, the, the features of that, that treaty, uh, it's, it, it was a good treaty and it's still in use today. Uh, it was very uh, forward-looking uh, and um, so Canada and the United States were given uh, equal powers in the use of the waters, of all the boundary waters across Canada and the United States. It, it set out the priorities for use of water, so the top priority would be sanitary and domestic uh, water usage, second navigation, third uh, for hydropower irrigation. We created a body called the International Joint Commission, which I'll talk about uh, later, but they're involved in, in uh, approving major projects that were, would, would occur and have an impact on, on ground waters. So a key part of the Boundary Waters Treaty, which in relation to Niagara, Article 5 of that Boundary Waters Treaty, it set the limits on how much water could be used for hydropower. And, um, getting used to this clicker here. So at that time, the United States 
was authorized to take uh, no more than uh, the daily diversion of 20,000 cubic feet per second total. Um, United Kingdom, or in, on behalf of Canada, we are authorized to use 36,000 cubic feet per second. Um, you may recall, uh, I, I mentioned the long-term average flow of, of the Niagara River was uh, 6,500 cubic meters, or that's about 200,000, 200,000 cubic feet per second. Um, so with this, uh, oh, and the water that gets used for sanitary domestic purposes was excluded uh, from, those, from those allocations. Um, so let me just talk about the IJC real quick here before we move on. But the IJC, it's a, it was a, a body that was created on the Waters Treaty to, again, to prevent and, and solve disputes um, in relation to water um, between Canada and the United States on the, the boundary waters. Uh, the IJC, it, it works on issues that are assigned by the governments, but it doesn't actually report to the governments. Um, it, it takes, uh, it's an advisory body, it's a uh, quasi-judicial purpose to sense issues and, and uh, report back to governments, give them, uh, give them Council or recommendations. Um, the commissioners that are part of the International Joint Commission, uh, they take an oath that they're to work in the interest of the people and not their countries. So it's a, uh, it's actually a key body that is, is still in existence today and uh, a very relevant body. The commission has six members, um, three Canadian and three United States. They're appointed by the, the prime minister or the, the U.S. President, and there's offices in, in Canada and United States. Um, these, these offices and uh, functions came a little later um, than, than original, but uh, just to be sort of complete and was most convenient to, to talk about them now, but the, the IGC also has created special boards and task forces when they're necessary or are problems that surface and, and governments need advice to, uh, uh, so they can call on governments to um, to help them. Now, going back to our, our story in Niagara, so we had the the Boundary Water Treaty of 1909, and then so shortly thereafter, um, the, the two countries started to take full advantage or wanted to take full advantage of their allocations. So the the second Sholkoff plant was built and opened in 1919. And over on the Canadian side, the Stratum Beck number one station opened in 1922. Now the Stratum Beck plant is, uh, was put in a different location than the other plants. Um, The, the Sholkoff plant is located right here. Most of the, all the other plants were, were what we call low head plants. They're, they're right around the brink of the falls. Um, but the, the Stratum Beck plant, the decision, uh, it was recognized that it would be more efficient to take the water downstream um, and develop hydropower there where the, the fall at Niagara Falls is about 60 meters. But if, as we move downstream, the fall at the, here is about 80, 90 meters, so that it's more uh, efficient to generate the power there. But that posed the challenge how to get the water down downstream. Um, so they had to develop, the Welland River actually flew this way, or flowed that way into the, uh, the Niagara River. So they created, they actually reversed, they dredged this, this portion of the Welland River, uh, reversed the flow, and then directed all the water through uh, an open cut channel that would go down to the Stratton Back One plant, which is, which is right here. Um, so quite a, quite a feat in terms of, of engineering. So, with, with the, the development of that, the Stratton Beck one plant um, and the other plants that were still all, all operating, the Ontario Power Generation here, Toronto Power, Canadian Niagara, um, Sholkoff, 
there was continued pressure to, let, to make better use or more use of, of the hydropower. Um, so there was debate and discussion for, for many years, and which led up to, uh, they could see that actually the pressure to, to, to use hydropower or to use the water of hydropower was going to be at the, to the detriment of Niagara Falls itself. Uh, if it remained unchecked. So rather than the, the two governments talked about, okay, should we increase the Canada's allocation a certain amount or U.S. allocation a certain amount and how high should that be? But what they did was in the, uh, the governments came to a different agreement, which is uh, what's called the 1950 Niagara Treaty. Uh, the purpose of that was to to preserve the scenic beauty of the falls and the Niagara River while providing for the most beneficial use of the water. So they decided to, is in the river, um, can, is split essentially 50-50 by the Canadian United States. Um, there's a little caveat there which we can get into during the iceberg. So uh, this was quite a uh, a forward-looking and novel approach uh, because it, for it basically sets up the, the the amount that has to be left in the river, and then the two countries can do what they want with the with the remaining. So, in order to accomplish the uh, the objectives of that 1950 treaty, the, the governments needed to do some engineering works to build a to build a dam and to do some uh, construction to meet the terms of the treaty. So the government's asked the International Joint Commission to look after the construction of the dam and um, to oversee the project. The IJC, in turn, created what's called the International Niagara Board of Control. <coughs> and this was created in 1953. So it consists of uh, two members for each country. And uh, the purpose of that board was to review and approve the design and the installation of the, both the dam and the remedial works at Niagara Falls. And then afterwards to progressively uh, to exercise control over the maintenance and the operation of that dam. Um, to basically to meet the terms of the treaty and to so ensure a, a dependable and adequate flow of water over the American Falls and the Three Sisters Islands, to provide an unbroken crest line over the Horseshoe Falls, and also to maintain the present relationship between the pool above Niagara Falls and the Niagara River flow. So this, the International Niagara Board of Control um, sanctioned a, or there was a, a model developed, this is a physical model called the Islington model. And um, so they did the design of uh, what's called the International Niagara Control Dam. They needed a dam to be able to manipulate the, the, the water above the falls. Um, and I'll show you a picture of the actual dam that was created. But this is a, this is a, a pretty big model. You can see for scale, it was in a warehouse in Toronto. It's a big model. Um, so in addition to this, this dam, they also needed to, to provide that unbroken crest line that was, was a part of the, um, of the directive from the IJC from the Board of Control. Was they had to do some dredging of the flanks of the, the Horseshoe Falls. So there was you know, just above the falls, uh, maybe, a, maybe a kilometer above the falls. And um, you don't see any of the, the excavations there, but you see the nice uh, the horseshoe there. So with the 1950 treaty in place, the International Niagara Control Dam created. Uh, I'll back up. The control dam is used to um, raise or lower the level of the pool above the falls, and, and um, that was done so that they could divert water through through tunnels, um, through additional tunnels that were going to be needed for for additional hydropower plants. Um, the stratum back number two plant was finished and opened in 1954, and it's, it's currently still in operation. And it sits right beside the Stratton Back Number One plant, so it's downstream at Queenston. <coughs> the water from that plant um, 
they needed more capacity than the open cut channel could provide, so they plan, they developed they dug tunnels underneath the city of Niagara Falls to bring the water um, down to the plant. So there's there's two two chan two tunnels, and if if you go there today, you'll see the the head gates uh, of the of, of the tunnels uh, just upstream of the Niagara Control Dam. Those are still there. Moving along in history, the on the U.S. side, uh, there was in 1956 uh, a disaster at the Sholkoff plant, the, the older Sholkoff plant. So in June 7th, 1956, there was, due to excessive seepage in behind that plant, there was a, a, a catastrophic collapse of, of the plant. There was um, 40 men working in the station for, or, at, at the time, according to a newspaper article at the time. And so 37 of them escaped. Um, and there was three who were missing at the time, two were located, but um, there was one person who lost their life. So with this, this was a catastrophic uh, failure. The, the other plant still remained intact, was still open. But this was a big hit to New York Power's uh, ability to generate, New York State's uh, ability to generate power. So immediately, um, and there was plans in the works before that time to, to develop a new plant, but the loss of this plant really put the pressure on the state to, to have a new plant. So. The New York State, they decided and built a new plant called the Robert Moses plant, and that is down in it's across the river from the Stratton Beck plants. This shows the, um, the plant itself, the, the four bay for the plant, and they built a, a giant reservoir in behind to, to store the water. Um, that there's, one, there's, a, there's a reservoir as well on the Canadian side above the Stratton Beck plants, and the purpose of the reservoirs is to uh, be able to take, when there's additional water in the river that's available under the treaty, uh, they can take it, they can pump it up into the reservoirs, and then sort of, sort of during the day when more water has to go over Niagara Falls, then they can drain those, drain those, uh, those reservoirs and um, use the water. But when they pump it up, uh, it takes energy, of course, but when, they, when it comes down from the reservoir, pump generation station, so there's a, they, they generate water that they generate electricity as it comes down in pump generation station as well. Uh, so there, there's one on the Canadian side as well. Here's a picture of the, just to get a scope of the, the size of the tunnels that were feeding the water to the New York power plant. This uh, picture, uh, you can see the two, the two main tunnels, this is the Niagara River up here. And to get a feeling for this, the size and the scale of the of the tunnels. This is a road and you can see cars or trucks there, so um, quite large. I, I didn't, I don't recall the diameter, but, but quite large. Um, and these two, two towers here, you can see this is uh, upstream of, of the falls on the New York side. These are the, these towers contain the head gates that, um, if necessary, can be used to, to shut off those, those tunnels. So, Things stayed pretty stable for um, a number of years. Uh, the older power plants on the Canadian side uh, started to, to reach their, the end of their life. Um, and because of that, there was, uh, on the Canadian side, Ontario Power Generation undertook a, a project to uh, Version tunnel to bring more water to the Stratton Back 2 complex uh, because with the the older plants were located I said before just right right below the falls um, these these plants um, were, were, were local plants they were they were aging they were providing 25 cycle power which wasn't really necessary uh, anymore so the decisions were made to use the, the back plants as the primary plants um, but there was, uh, at, at that point in time, just not enough diversion capacity to, to bring the water that the Canada, its full treaty share. Um, so Ontario Power Generation undertook a large project starting in about 2005, between 2005 and 2013, to dig a new tunnel 
Um, so they started at the, the, back, the back complex and uh, with a tunnel boring machine dug again underneath the, the city of Niagara Falls, back upstream. Um, th this one here, you can see the, the location of the, the tunnels in the New York side and the dash lines of the location of the tunnels, the older tunnels that were done in, in the cities. This was a huge project uh, that was just recently computed. Um, this is a picture of the, the tunnel boring machine that we've used. It, it, it dug a tunnel that was 14.4 meters in diameter. And you could, to get a, you get a feeling for the scope and the size of that, you can see the workers here, so. And here's a picture of the tunnel that was, that was dug, it was huge. So the output of the tunnel, talk about engineering marble, they started downstream at Queenston, dug underneath the city of Niagara Falls, and the, the, the termination of the tunnel, um, the intake for the water, was right below the first gate of that International Niagara Control Structure. So the precision uh, guidance systems of that tunnel boring machine are just are incredible. This picture here, you see um, the area around the, the first gate of the control structure where that was copper dammed off in preparation uh, for the construction of that, that first tunnel, that last tunnel. And this is a picture of the intake, so you don't see this anymore. This is the, this is the dam above the water that you will see, but the intake uh, is right here. And this is a picture of the tunnel boring when they, when they were taking it apart. <coughs> so the, the tunnel boring machine, it broke through in 2010, and then the, 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 the tunnel went into service, I believe, in 2013. So quite a bit of history, construction, in uh, uh, development, and changing of, of the hydropower facilities in the area over time. Uh, now I'm going to get into some of the the board of controls responsibilities in this area, which uh, are, which are ongoing today. So the Niagara Board of Control, we have two main areas of responsibility, and that is the uh, overseeing the the, the water levels in the Chippewa grass side of the pool and the operation of that, that, that control dam. Yeah. The, the second area of responsibility we have is uh, each year there's a, an ice boom that gets put in the outlet of Lake Erie. Um, and there's a picture of the boom. And I'll get into the, what that's all about. But um, moving forward. The board is comprised of, as it was in 1953, um, two members for Canada and two for the United States. And so I'm the, the chair for, of the, the Canadian section, um, and I work with Environment and Climate Change Canada. The other member of the, from Canada is from the province of Ontario, Ms. Jennifer Key. She's from the uh, Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. On the U.S. side, the, the chair is uh, Brigadier General Mark Toy. He's with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And uh, the other member is Mr. David Kafka. He's with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And we're also supported by two secretaries, uh, Bryce Carmichael and Derek Beach. In addition to the, to the Board of Control, there's another body called the International Iron Committee. The Board of Control looks over after the preparation uh, of that Niagara Control Dam and the, the ice boom. The International Niagara Committee, it was uh, it's specifically charged at making sure that the two countries are meeting their requirements under the terms of the 1950 treaty. So there's one member for each country that is appointed to, uh, to verify, record, report on the water levels, so the water usage at Niagara Falls every hour of every day and report to the countries. Uh, the two members of that committee were 1955 called the International Niagara Committee and uh, rather than reporting right to the International Joint Commission which the Board of Control does, the International Niagara Committee reports straight to the governments. Um, the composition of that committee were the same people. I'm the, the Canadian uh, Chair of the International Niagara Committee and, and Burger General Toy is the Chair on the U.S., the member on the U.S. side. 
to help us with uh, keeping track of all these numbers and the reporting and uh, to provide the field, um, field observations. We have a working committee that's uh, comprised of eight members, both from the United States government and also uh, the power authority. So Mr. Mike Asler, he's from the New York Power Authority. On the Canadian side, we have uh, Representative uh, Mr. Kirk Cornelson from Ontario Power Generation and representatives from the, uh, the government agencies there. So what do we do in terms of Chippewa Grass Island Pool operation? Um, so water, uh, the Chippewa Grass Island Pool is in this area in between, in between Grand Island and the International Niagara Control Dam. So the water in that pool can, uh, has three choices to get over, has three exit points. The first, uh, it can flow over the falls. And um, as I said before, the, the minimums have to flow over the falls according to what is specified in the, the 1950 Niagara Treaty. The other pass, uh, water uh, is diverted through the, the tunnels on the American side to the New York Power Authority plant or on the Canadian side through either the open cut channel or the three Ontario Power Generation tunnels down to the back complex. So the level of the Chippewa Grass Island pool, the difference between the level of the pool and the levels of the, uh, the four base of the plants is, uh, controls the diversions. The board of control sets out uh, the actual Day-to-day -day operations or hour -to -hour operations are conducted by the, the power entities, um, Ontario Power Generation, New York Power Authority. But the overall rules and, and um, the higher level is the responsibility of the board. So the board has established a directive that the power entities have to follow. And we monitor four different things. The first is uh, the long-term when, when the project was, uh, was designed, the, one of the uh, parts in the, in the directive from the IJC was that the level of the relationship between the level of the Chippewa Grass Island Pool and Lake Erie has to stay constant where it was with history. So we, don't, we want to make sure that the long-term difference, the long-term deviation um, is, is around zero. The maximum it can be is 0 0.91 meters. So, um, we also want to make sure that month-to-month -month changes are within a certain threshold. They can't be more than 15 centimeters. Um, the daily range of that pool can be larger than 0.46 meters. And uh, the minimum and maximum levels, there's, there's minimum and maximum levels that uh, the power entities must maintain that, that the pool level within. Uh, the board and the, and the commission um, we monitor to make sure that the board of the Niagara Committee uh, make sure that there's no violations of the 1950 Niagara Treaty. So there, for no hour of the day can the water be less than that 100,000 cubic, meters per se, cubic feet per second uh, during the day or 50,000 at night. And uh, during this reporting period, and actually for quite some time, there's been no um, false fall violations. Uh, now, there is, there is instances where um, the treaty minimums can be ignored. There's that, that dam uh, can be used there's, during uh, emergency situations. If somebody uh, were to slip in the water above the falls, the, the power entities have carte blanche approval. They can do what they can, close the gates, um, lower the water levels above the falls in, in efforts to try and Save, save somebody or in, in a life uh, saving situation. They have carte blanche approval to do that, but, um, and there's some other, other little exceptions, but for the most part, the 1950 treaty levels, they, they have, to be, uh, have to be maintained. Now the board also, uh, we monitor water levels and uh, conditions of the Niagara River. Um, water levels in, uh, most of the Great Lakes Basin are above, above normal right now. Um, sorry. This is showing a, a, a slide of the current Lake Superior water levels. Um, to understand this slide, so the, 
The black levels, the black lines here, um, and, and the date, those are the all-time record highs. Um, at the bottom, similarly, the all-time record lows and, and the date. The dashed blue line is long-term average, and the red line would be the, the current water levels. Um, and then this dashed green line and this hashed area, that's our, our forecast for water levels for the next six months. So water levels uh, are on Lake Superior above average, are expected to be above average for the next six months. Similarly, Lake Michigan and Huron um, are, are above average. And our water levels on Lake Erie, and coincidentally, what Niagara River flows are, are above average. On the Niagara River itself, the board undertakes an, a number of uh, hydrometric monitoring activities to uh, in, ensure the terms of the treaty are, are, are met. So we have a number of sections that where we go out and take uh, discharge measurements, um, both at the American Falls and down the Ashton Avenue and um, we also we have a combination of water level monitoring stations and discharge measuring stations because the, the treaty requires that you know, we, we verify that the discharge in the river is at certain thresholds, but it's actually easier. Um, you can't really measure, it's more difficult to measure discharge on a continuous basis. So we, we measure water levels on a continuous basis at a number of stations and then we maintain ratings um, to rate mathematical relationships between water levels and discharge. Um, so our key water level measuring stations are the American Falls station here at B and the, the Ashland Avenue water level station uh, uh, in the gorge just below the falls. This is the, a picture of the water level gauging station. It's a small concrete structure um, that inside of it has uh, a number of uh, recorded uh, instruments. There's a well that in the base of that structure that connects down into the Niagara River. And um, with that well, there's a pipe that goes out into the river that, so that the water level in, that, in, that, uh, um, in the well is the same as the water level in the, in the river. So that, uh, and we have a, a, a gauge that records the position of that of that, uh, of the water level, and there's basically a tape that extends down to the bottom of the water level that, that then gets recorded and um, reported through telemetry back to our, to our databases. Um, so we have, uh, we have regular uh, six minute water level observations that are taken at that station. I'll back up, the station is, um, is jointly operated by the, the power entities, New York Power Authority and Ontario Power Generation, but also uh, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So there's, there's quite a bit of equipment in that powerhouse, or sorry, in that gauging house that uh, um, our board relies on. So we need to be able to determine what the discharge is in the river. In order to do that, we have a, a discharge measuring um, section just upstream of the outlets of the New York Power Authority plant and the, um, well, both plants. So this is, the, this is the section here that I'm talking about. At that section, um, we need to take discharge. And the way we measure discharge, um, historically, we, there was a, a cableway that strung across the river. And um, so our staff would have to go in that, that cableway, um, and we would lower, um, lower a line down into the river that would, uh, and we detach a price couple, couple of meters that uh, would spin around and measure the velocity of the river um, as it passes by. And so we'd have to divide the cross section of the river up into, uh, there was a number of sections, uh, I think 40 sections or so that uh, and we'd also, you have to measure the velocity. Velocity will vary uh, by depth as well, not only the horizontal uh, extent of the cross section, but also by depth. So they had to sit in this cableway and um, take 10 depth, set, 10, 10 settings of this price meter and do that in like 30, 40 panels across the river. So that, 
as you can imagine, that could take a lot of time. This particular one and, and audit, spot audit the water usage of in, in the plants that completely wiped out th this bridge. Ice can also have uh, caused issues in the upper river above, above Niagara Falls. Um, if there's too much ice that gets built up in around Grand Island, uh, then you can have uh, flooding, local flooding along the river. And the hydro entities, um, we don't really want the ice to interfere with the, the, the water intakes. So back in 1964, um, there was uh, an additional responsibility added to the, to the Board of Control that uh, to oversee the installation and the operation of the, in, oversee the installation and the removal of what's called the Lake Erie Niagara Ice Boom. So there's a boom, that, this is the outlet of Lake Erie. Um, there's a boom that gets installed uh, each year and uh, the purpose of that boom is to help the natural ice arch that would form at the outlet of Lake Erie to just accelerate the, the formation of that natural ice arch and to uh, keep as much ice as possible on Lake Erie where it doesn't cause it much damage um, and keep it out of the Niagara River where it can cause problems at both in the May of the Mist Pool or along the Niagara River or clog up the intakes for the, for the uh, power entities. This is a picture of the boom itself. Um, the boom consists of uh, a number of steel pontoons that are, that are chained together. The, the size of those, they range from about 15 feet to 30 feet in length. And the diameter of those are uh, 30 inches, 30 inches of diameter. Um, so these get tugged out, uh, pulled out in 500 foot sections into uh, uh, the mouth of the Lake Erie and they get tied to, tied to barrels and anchored in place. Um, the I set out uh, in the order some rules that uh, the power entities would have to follow putting that boom out and taking it in. Um, the boom goes out. Uh, the, the current rules are the, the boom can go out when Lake Erie water level the water temperatures reaches 4 degrees Celsius or December 16th, whichever one comes first. Uh, this is a picture of with, with the boom in place and just some of the ice that formed in behind it during the 2017-2018 season. The amount of ice that forms on Lake Erie uh, varies from year to year. Um, some years you get near complete coverage, as in 2014-15, um, to very little ice in 15-16 and 16-17. This past year, as you remember, it was, it was fairly cold and there was a good, uh, almost complete ice cover formed on, on, on Lake Erie. Uh, through the Board of Control, because we have that order of approval to um, to install the boom and to take it out and to, to monitor general ice conditions on the lake, uh, we conduct uh, measurements of the ice thickness on on the lake each year when there, when there's enough ice. Uh, we do that in a couple ways. This uh, when there is enough ice, we will send a helicopter uh, crew out. And they, they land on six, six spots on the ice and take cores, of, measure the thickness of the ice. Um, we've been doing that since uh, 1983, so we've got a nice long um, scientific data set. Um, the crews that do this, these ice thicknesses generally uh, staff from Environment Canada, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, or, or the power entities. This particular picture, this is uh, a Lieutenant Colonel Chikansky from the Buffalo Corps of Engineers who's taking the, uh, the ice thickness and this is uh, one of his subordinates who's actually just standing over his boss and watching him do the work so this is a, this is a, this is a rare opportunity for that to happen but um, and Frank also he, he's uh, been on the helicopter many times as, as has Len so I want to talk more about that feel free um, so I talked about when ice the ice boom goes in December 4th or December 16th or when it reaches 4 degrees Celsius. Um, the boom has to be taken out uh, either on April 1st or when there's uh, 
there's less than 250 square meters of ice remaining on the lake. Or that, that equates to 650 square kilometers. So the board, we have to monitor how much ice there is on the lake. Uh, we do that a number of ways. Um, we saw about the thickness that we get from our helicopter measurements, but the, uh, the aerial extent, we use uh, satellite imagery um, a lot nowadays. This is a picture of a uh, satellite image from this past year. Um, these, these slides show the progression of ice from January through January, uh, where we had uh, good buildup, and then there was an ice melt, and then um, again in February, the ice cover thicken. In through March to March 26. So as I mentioned before, the rules, uh, the, the ice boom has to come out on April 1st, if, or if there's, uh, unless there's more than 250 square meters of ice remaining. So in around the end of March this year, um, through the observations that we had, uh, we determined that there was, there was too much ice for the boom to come out on April 1st, so we let out a a, a meteor release you know, that, that it would not be open. Um, we rely on the, the side lane imagery, but we also undertake uh, fixed wing ice flights. Um, sometimes the, there's not 100% trust in the side lane imagery right now, and um, over the years we've, we've relied on um, fixed wing ice observations. Um, to sort of validate what we see from the satellite or from the, from the other uh, ways we can estimate the ice. So we, we, did, a, we did an ice flight this year um, to verify how much ice there was on the lake. Um, and ice boom removal, it started on April 10th and uh, it was it's completed April 19th this year. Uh, more information on the boom, the Corps of Engineers did a really good uh, video explaining what the what the ice boom is, what it's used for, and some of the observations. Um, you can go to their. We have that on our website if you wanted to watch that. And we also we also produce a yearly ice boom that uh, we release to the public. And uh, the current one is is under is under preparation now. Last topic before we get to the uh, the icebreaker is Horseshoe and American Falls recession. Uh, you remember from the start of my slide that we have these, the Niagara Falls has progressed uh, quite a ways from, from where the falls were originally. And that recession uh, is still occurring. Here you can see the, the position of the crest of the Horseshoe Falls uh, back in 1764. Um, you can see the recession in the falls, it, it follows two different patterns. There's the, the, the falls is either like a a horseshoe shape, or it can take a, a notched, notch shape where you have accelerated erosion in the middle of the falls and weaker erosion at the banks. Um, the present shape of the falls, the horseshoe falls, is indeed like a horseshoe. Um, but we are charged with, uh, from, from the IJC, to monitor the, the recession um, to make sure, again, that the, uh, that the shape of the falls is such that there, there is a dependable Bendable and adequate flow of water over the Horseshoe Falls. The American Corps of Engineers filled in part of the American flank uh, by Goat Island and made the approach, um, the edge of the falls approach uh, the Canadian border. Um, I don't know. There, there was, uh, is my microphone still working or? Okay. Uh, so just to make sure I understand your question, was, was there a time when there, sort of the American Falls, the flanks of the American Falls were dredged or changed and... Uh, yes, I've heard that the, um, from Goat Island, they extended the island out and approached the Canadian border, Canada, U.S. border as well. I don't know. I'd, I'd have to check my facts on that one. Uh, there's been a lot of manipulation in both sides of the falls. Uh, I didn't have time to mention, but you know, the American Falls itself, they were um, back in the 60s. There was um, a study done on the erosion of the American Falls. So in order to do that, that study, they 
coffer dammed off the whole American Falls, shut the American Falls off for a period of time. Um, they were looking to, to see whether there's all this talus below, all these large rocks and boulders below the American Falls, whether it would make sense to take, to take and remove all that. Um, but there was you know, an engineering study done and in the end they decided not to do anything. There might have been some work done like you're talking about during that, that time period, but I'd have to, I'd have to check. Lovely explanation and lovely graphics about measuring the water flow when there's no ice on the river. What if there's cover on the river? How do you measure water? Okay, um, the water level monitoring that can be done 365 days, no matter if there's ice on the river or not. Um, the calibration of the, the taking discharge in terms of uh, maintaining that rating, it's hard to get measurements of discharge during ice. Um, we don't have, because nowadays we have to we use ADCP, so we have to put a boat in the river. Um, so generally in the winter, the, the boat launches are all closed. Um, we, mo most of the ratings we use, they're calibrated sort of ice-free time periods. Um, and we, we have some, we basically have to apply those ratings to the ice time periods. We have some some adjustments we can make on those, but it's um, the other thing is the presence of that ice boom um, keeps a lot of the ice out of the river. And there's the, the section, the American Falls section there, that where we're where we're um, sorry, the Ashton Avenue Falls section. The water is moving very fast there; it's rapid, so the ice doesn't tend to build up in that area. Um, so uh, ice in winter time does pose challenges for, for taking measurements, that's for sure, but we have either, we either extend the equations through the wintertime period or uh, we make adjustments the best we can. So, thanks. Any other questions? Hi, Aaron, thanks, great talk. Um, Curious when you guys dig in those kilometer long uh, boreholes uh, uh, for redoing the tunnels, if you found anything interesting in the journey, or if that's uh, any folklore around that. Um, okay, well, the, the, the tunnels, I'll say that was an Ontario Power Generation project. Uh, they, it, was, it was their project. They sort of reported to the, the board and we reported to the, to the commission. So, um, we weren't doing that work, so I'd have to defer to to them to see if there's anything interesting found in in those tunnels. But um, and there there are some representatives from OPG here tonight, or former OPG employees. But, so yeah, I'm sure there were some interesting things. Uh, last call for questions, probably. wondering if you have to make decisions when there's flooding on the upper Great Lakes to let more water come through. Um, the Niagara, that control gem on the, the Chippewa Grass Island Pool, uh, you'll notice that it doesn't go all the way across the river. It only goes two-thirds of the way across the river. So because it don't, doesn't go all the way across the river, uh, we don't have complete control over the the level such that we could have an influence on uh, Lake Lake Erie. That particular that dam itself it has no impact on Lake Erie. There's depending on what you do in the Chippewa Grass Island Pool, there's no measurable impact on Lake Erie. So um, the point is, we don't have any control really based on uh, with that structure, with what's coming down from the upper lakes, or, or, or we don't really have any impact. Um, that's different than, say, the, the structure at um, Sault Ste. Marie, uh, at the Old of Lake Superior, where there, it, it goes completely across the river, so there is a bit of control that you can do there. Or, or the other one in the St. Lawrence River at, at Cornwall, Messina, where the structure goes right across, and there's regulation of, of Lake Ontario and the St. Lawrence River. But there is no regulation at all of Lake Erie. Um, so this our board, we have really limited 
um, regulatory capacity. Just we only um, the dam only influences that level of the Chippewa Grass Island pool, so really local area. Thanks again, Aaron. That was a, a great talk to kick off our meeting here in the falls and just a oh. small token of the Thanks. CGU's appreciation for you. Thank you. To kick us off and Thank you. Thank you. Great. And I okay. sure if there's other questions we can yeah. up upstairs at the uh, Sure, I'll stay for a while. So uh, yeah, great. please please come and talk to me one on one or or Frank or there's a few others. Sure. Thanks. Thanks to everybody for coming and helping us kick off a 2018 meeting. And welcome and welcome to the falls. Enjoy your time at the conference as well as in the, the city. And um, I guess that's it. We'll uh, we'll adjourn until we, we meet upstairs with the icebreaker. Thanks again.